What we're going to do in this video is take all those concepts that we learned in the last video and apply them to develop the energy balance climate model. Now what we're really after in this energy balance climate model is a prediction for the surface temperature of the Earth. But remember, the Earth and its atmosphere is in a giant vacuum. And that means we can't have any conduction or convection as methods of heat flow to the Earth. The only heat transfer to the Earth is going to have to come from radiation. And any radiation that's reflected will not increase the temperature of the Earth because it just comes in and then gets reflected back out. What's really important is that radiation that gets absorbed. And if we're going to have a steady state temperature, that is, if we're going to have an equilibrium situation, then that would mean that this incoming power has to be the same size as the outgoing power. If the incoming power is just a little bit bigger, then of course the temperature is going to rise. If the outgoing power is a little bit bigger, the temperature is going to fall. So we're looking for the temperature at which those two are going to be in balance, in equilibrium. Now often we're going to do this and we're going to talk about intensities rather than powers. But remember, intensity is simply the power per unit area. So if I write the intensity input, that would be the power input divided by the area. And the intensity output would be the power out divided by the area. So in saying that these two are equal, we're also saying that the intensities are equal. That is, the input intensity is going to have to equal the output intensity if we're going to have this equilibrium situation. Let's start by considering the input intensity. And so the first thing we want to think about is the intensity that's available from the sun, and that would really be that solar constant that we talked about before. There's about 1340 watts per meter squared striking the top of the atmosphere where the rays from the sun are striking directly. But of course, there's a problem with that. Because if you consider the Earth itself, of course, this area of the Earth is dark. It's nighttime there. It's not receiving any intensity at all. But there's a very easy way to simplify this. Because we know the intensity coming in is this S, 1340 watts per meter squared. So what we do is we picture a circular disk. And every single ray that passes through that circular disk is going to strike the Earth. None of them miss. All of that power that was going through this circle is going to strike the Earth. But now, of course, it's going to be spread out over a bigger area. And in fact, the surface area of the Earth is 4 pi r squared, whereas the surface area of this circle is only pi r squared, where, of course, r is the radius of the Earth. In other words, this is four times as large. We're taking that power and spreading it out over four times the area. And that means that that incoming intensity is going to be less than S by a factor of four. Now we're not quite done with that input intensity. And that's because if we consider the Earth and the sunlight coming in, some of the sunlight gets reflected off, and some of the sunlight is absorbed. And this reflected light, it does not contribute to the warming up of the Earth. It's kind of like in the summertime, you wear a black t-shirt, you absorb the sun's rays, you get hotter. If you were to wear a shiny silver t-shirt, all the light would reflect, and the sunlight itself wouldn't be helping to heat you up. Of course, the fraction of that solar radiation that is reflected is called the albedo, alpha. And the fraction that absorbed is, of course, 1 minus alpha. That's the fraction absorbed. And that's the fraction that's going to contribute to our input intensity. So here's our expression if we include just the radiation that's absorbed and not the radiation that's reflected. So now we have this expression for the input intensity 
And what we need to work on is our expression for the output intensity. Well, it turns out that's pretty easy because the Earth is effectively a black body radiator. It's an object at some temperature and it's radiating energy. So we can use the Stefan Boltzmann equation. And that is the output intensity is going to have to be equal to the emissivity of the Earth, it tends to be about 0.95, times the Stefan Boltzmann constant, times the average surface temperature of the Earth in Kelvin raised to the fourth power. And now, of course, all we need to do is equate our output to our input and solve for t here. So let's do that. If I rearrange solve for t, I'm going to get, well, something to the quarter power. And that something is going to be s times 1 minus the albedo all over top of 4 emissivity times the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So let's put our numbers in and see what we get. S, uh, let's take S to be, say, 1,350 watts per meter squared. Typical value for the albedo of the Earth, an average value, would be about 0.3. Emissivity of the Earth, usually taken to be about 0.95. And, of course, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. Put that into your calculator, you should get an answer of 257 Kelvin, or negative 16 degrees Celsius. Now, today, here in Brampton, January 3rd, in the morning, the temperature was negative 16 degrees Celsius, but that was totally untypical. I'd be expecting the average temperature of the Earth to be somewhere around perhaps 15 degrees, roughly 30 degrees bigger than our current prediction. So the next question we have is, What's wrong with our model? What are we missing out in our model? Now, you'll recall that the temperature in the Stefan Boltzmann law, it's really a surface temperature. So that prediction of negative 16 degrees Celsius is a surface temperature. But you'll recall we really didn't distinguish between the Earth and the atmosphere. We were really looking at the Earth atmosphere system. And of course, there is no top of the atmosphere, right? It just kind of peters out. And if we choose a height of, say, 5 kilometers here, and I can use this graph, I draw a horizontal line and go across, I'm going to re reach this red line right here. And that tells me what the temperature is at 5 kilometers. And it turns out it's pretty close to negative 16 degrees Celsius. So at about 5 kilometers up from the surface of the Earth, the average temperature is about 16 degrees Celsius. That's a good prediction. That number, 5 kilometers, is kind of significant because if I consider the atmosphere and I draw a line here at 5.6 kilometers, I would find that I'd have just as many air molecules above that line as I have air molecules below that line. So in a sense, 5.6 kilometers is kind of a good average place to call the top of the atmosphere. And just as a brief note, this diagram here is way out of scale. The Earth's atmosphere, compared to the diameter of the Earth, is like a thin mist on a billiard ball. It's that small. And that's why we have to be particularly protective of our atmosphere, because it is so tiny. So if we want our prediction for the temperature to be the actual surface of the Earth and not the temperature somewhere in the atmosphere, then we forgot something really important in our model. We've taken into account the solar radiation coming in, but we haven't taken into account that there's going to be radiation coming from the atmosphere because of the greenhouse gases. So what did we forget in our model? We forgot the greenhouse effect. And what we're going to do in a few of the upcoming problems is to take into account the greenhouse effect in our model. Okay, we have a few IB multiple choice questions. First question, you're assuming the atmosphere is radiating energy and the ground is radiating energy. And the intensity of those two radiations is supposed to be the same. So read over the question, try it out for yourself, come back for the answer.
Now, the ground is being taken as a perfect back body radiator. That means the intensity emitted will be sigma times the temperature of the ground to the fourth power. Whereas the atmosphere is not a perfect black body radiator, therefore you have to put in that extra factor of the emissivity. Now, these two quantities have to be the same, and that means that we have that equality. Sigmas, of course, are going to cancel out, and we're going to get that Tg to the fourth divided by Ta to the fourth will equal the emissivity. Now I can raise both sides to the quarter power, and I'll get that Tg divided by Ta is equal to the emissivity to the quarter power. So the correct answer there is C. Here's a second multiple choice question on the climate model. What I'd like you to do is read the question over, try it out for yourself, and then come back for the answer. Now, all you really need to know in this question is, what is albedo? And it's the fraction of incident radiation that gets reflected. So, 100 watts per meter squared gets reflected out of 340 watts per meter squared. And that means the correct answer is B, 100 divided by 340. Here's a question that I think was a great instructional question, but I don't think it was such a great exam question because I think it was a bit unfair, and I'll explain that as I go along. What I'd like you to do is read the question over, make sure you understand it, and then come back for my response. So in this question, this is an average value of the intensity of the radiation striking the top of the atmosphere. And we're given a bit of information about our atmosphere. We're told it's emissivity, it's albedo, but also it's temperature. And it's a body with warmth. And that means it's going to radiate energy, just like a black body radiator. It's going to radiate as an imperfect black body. And the intensity of that radiation will be characteristic of this temperature here. And we can work out what that intensity is. And that's what they're asking for in part one here. They're asking for the power radiated per unit area. Well, that's just the intensity of the atmosphere. So this should work out to be 140 watts per meter squared. Let's see. It's an imperfect black body radiator. That means that we have to take the emissivity, multiply it by Stefan Boltzmann constant, times the temperature of the atmosphere in Kelvin, raised to the fourth power. So that'll be 0.72 times 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 times 242 to the fourth power. And I'll let you work that out, but you should get an answer of 140 watts per meter squared. Good question. Second thing they ask is the solar power absorbed per unit area at the surface of the Earth. And that's really being represented by this arrow right here. That's what we're trying to find out. Now, there is a very simplest climate model. And what it does is it assumes that this incident radiation, the stuff that doesn't reflect, some of it is going to reflect. But the rest of it, we assume it's all UV radiation, and all the UV radiation passes directly through the atmosphere. Now, I think it was a shame in the question that they didn't state the assumptions of that simplest model. Because if you're a thinking student, then you've probably seen one of these black body radiation curves, and you know that the surface temperature of the sun is about 6,000 K. And you can see from this diagram that there's all kinds of infrared radiation. Of course, the infrared radiation would be at least partially absorbed by the atmosphere. The second problem is, of course, that if it has some emissivity, that means that it absorbs some of the radiation incident on it. But in this simplest model, what we do is assume that that is all UV radiation, and it goes straight through the atmosphere. And the only thing we have to be concerned about is the fraction that reflects. And of course, the fraction that reflects from the atmosphere will be given by this albedo here. And so if you want to know how much radiation reflects off the top of the atmosphere, we can just multiply the albedo by 344 watts per meter squared. The albedo was 0.28 multiply that by 344, you'll get an answer there of 96 watts per meter squared. And then in this model, what we can assume is that the remaining radiation passed straight through. And that remaining radiation would, of course, be 344 minus 96, which is equal to 248 watts per meter squared. 
So this value here would be 248 watts per meter squared. And here's the rest of the question. Once again, pause the video, read over the question, make sure you understand what it's asking, see how far you can get with it, and then come back for the answer. Now, if you didn't understand the assumptions of that basic, of that simplest model, then you're li unlikely to get any points for the rest of the question. Okay. So our atmosphere, it's still going to radiate energy. It's going to re radiate a little more energy because it's at a higher temperature now. The new radiation of the atmosphere is going to be given by the emissivity, 0 0.72, times the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8, times the new temperature, which is 6 degrees more than the old one, 242 plus 6, all to the fourth power. If you multiply that out, you should get an answer of 154 watts per meter squared. They then ask how much energy was absorbed by the Earth's surface. Well, it was the same energy coming in, same amount is reflected, and the same amount travels straight through. That doesn't change at all. It's still going to be 248 watts per meter squared. Then they ask you to find out the increase in temperature of the Earth's surface. Well, we know how much energy is coming into the surface. It's going to be 248 of that direct solar radiation plus another 154 due to the radiation from the atmosphere. Add that up, you get 402 watts per meter squared. Now let's look at the output intensity. We can treat the Earth as a black body radiator. It has a characteristic temperature. We're asked to assume it's a perfect black body radiator. That means we can take the emissivity to be one and we just take the Stefan-Boltzmann constant and multiply it by the new temperature of the Earth, which we don't yet know. But all we have to do now is to equate that input intensity to the output intensity to solve for the temperature of the Earth. So we can say that 402 must be equal to Stefan-Boltzmann constant times the temperature of the Earth to the fourth power. And if you work that out, you get an answer here of 290 Kelvin. And that means the temperature increased by 2 degrees. So delta T would be equal to 290 minus the original temperature of the Earth, 288, for an increase of 2 Kelvin. And there's one other equation in the data booklet that we haven't considered yet. And it basically tells you how much is the temperature of a surface, say of the Earth, going to warm up given that there's more radiation being absorbed by that surface than there is coming out of that surface. It's actually quite easy to derive. If we take our equations for surface heat capacity, rearrange it for the change in temperature, we get that the change in temperature will equal the heat added divided by the surface heat capacity and the area. Well, the heat being added will be equal to power times time. But in this case here, we're going to have some input power and some output power. And of course, P in minus out will be the net power coming in to our surface. Multiply power by time, that gives you the energy. So that's the heat being added. And now you'll probably recognize power divided by area. That's just the intensity. So I can rewrite this equation as input intensity minus output intensity times time divided by the surface heat capacity. And you'll recall from a previous video that that surface heat capacity will be equal to the density of that surface times the depth of that surface, assuming that you have a uniform depth across the entire area, and often that's a reasonable assumption, times the specific heat capacity of that material. So if you're talking about a layer of ice, you'd be talking about the specific heat capacity of ice. So in a lot of practical problems, you'll write that delta T equals input intensity minus output intensity times time divided by density times depth times specific heat capacity. And let's see how that works 
in a problem. Here's a question involving increase in temperature of a surface. What I'd like you to do is to read over the question, try it out for yourself, and then come back for the answer. Okay, let's write down all the information we're given. We've got this ice that has a depth of 0 0.1 meters. The specific heat capacity in MKS units will be 2,000. The density of ice is 920. We also know the emissivity of ice is 0 0.95. We know the intensity of the radiation coming in is 3,000 watts per meter squared, but we don't know the intensity output. And that's what we're asked for in part A, the output intensity. Well, this is an imperfect black body radiator, and so we can use Stefan Boltzmann law to determine that output energy. It'll just be the emissivity times Stefan Boltzmann constant times the temperature to the fourth power. Now, be a bit careful with the temperature. The temperature begins at negative 5 degrees Celsius, and it's going to warm up to 0 degrees Celsius. So the average temperature would be negative 2.5 degrees Celsius, which is what? 270.5 Kelvin. And you've got to use Kelvin in this equation here. So our emissivity, 0 0.95, and the Stefan Boltzmann constant, and this average temperature, raised to the fourth power. If you multiply that out, you should get a output intensity of about 288 watts per meter squared. Part B, they ask you for the input intensity. Well, that's just the 300 watts per meter squared. And then in part C, they ask you for the amount of time it's going to take before it melts. Well, we can start with this equation and rearrange it so that we can solve for the time. So the time is going to be given by, so rearranging that equation, we obtain this equation for the time. Now, I'm not given the surface heat capacity. We'll have to use the relationship that the surface heat capacity will equal the density times the depth times the specific heat capacity. Substituting our values in, 920, 0 0.1, 2,000 increases the temperature by 5 degrees Celsius, or Kelvin, and our intensities input and 288 for the output. Plug it into your calculator, you should get an answer of about 77,000 seconds, which is approximately 21 hours. So it should take about 21 hours to raise the temperature of the ice until it begins to melt. And that's all for today. Thank you very much.